opportunity to introduce our next speaker. Um, so Dr. Abdul Rahman is uh, a hematologist with specialization in thrombosis and hemostasis at uh, UHN in Toronto. Uh, he's an assistant professor at the University of Toronto and he completed his hematology training at the University of Alberta followed by his fellowship at uh, University of Toronto. He is the inaugural fellow in the Alexander Yao Fellowship Program. He also completed a Master's of Epidemiology at McMaster University. And as an early career investigator, he's quite interested in um, clinical uh, trials, uh, looking at uh, direct oral anticoagulates and uh, venous thrombosis. Um, so it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Um, Abdul Raymond, and he'll be talking about direct oral anticoagulants in elderly patients and extremes of body weight. Thank you. Uh, great. Thanks for the introduction. Okay, so here's my disclosures. Uh, we've been through this already, so I won't go through it again. Okay. So the learning objectives for this session are first to appraise the evidence for the use of DOAX in the elderly and second, to appraise the evidence for the use of DOAX in those with extremes of weight. Okay. We'll start with DOAX in the elderly, and we'll begin with a case. So Mr. Y is an eight-year-old gentleman with a new diagnosis of atrial fibrillation. He has a past medical history of hypertension, type 2 diabetes, and previous stroke. He takes amlodipine and metformin. He has no previous bleeding history, but he did have two falls last year. His weight is 70 kilograms and his creatinine is 80. So with Kokoroff gold calculation, his creatinine clearance is 64. So my question for you is would you anticoagulate this patient? Option A, no antiplatelet or anticoagulation. Option B, antiplatelet only. Option C, anticoagulate with a vitamin K antagonist, so VKA. Or option D, anticoagulate with the DOAC. So I'll give you some time there to Pick your answer. All right, so let's see what we have. Perfect, okay, great. So most people saying anticoagulate with a DOAC, okay, great. Okay, so let's keep that in the back of your mind uh, and we'll go through this talk and then we'll come back later. So DOAC use in the elderly is an increasingly common issue that we will encounter in clinical practice. We have an aging population in Canada. The prevalence of those over 75 has been increasing and continues to increase. By 2020, an estimated 6% of the population will be over age 75. Furthermore, increasing age is an established risk factor for both AFib, as seen in the figure on the left, and VTE, as seen on the figure on the right both of which are managed with anticoagulation. The big concern with anticoagulation in the elderly is older age itself is a large risk factor for bleeding. This increased bleeding risk is likely multifactorial. Elderly individuals are more likely to have multiple comorbidities, such as diabetes or cancer that can increase bleeding risk. They may have decreased renal function due to comorbidities, vascular disease, or simply altered vascular responsiveness. They may have decreased hepatic function, as with increasing age, there is decreased hepatic blood flow and hepatocyte mass. They have altered pharmacokinetics with an increased body fat and decreased body water. There may have an effect on plasma drug concentration. Polypharmacy is common, increasing the potential for drug-drug interactions and concomitant use of antiplatelet or NSAIDs and they have an increased risk of falls. Every year, approximately a quarter of individuals over age of 65 will have a fall. This heightened concern of bleeding risk on anticoagulation can have negative consequences, with elderly patients being undertreated or underdosed. We can see this in the atrial fibrillation data. So this is older data from 2009 before DOACs from the Canadian Stroke Network Registry. About two thirds of these patients were age over 75. We can see that in patients admitted for acute ischemic stroke with known atrial fibrillation at high risk for stroke without contraindication to anticoagulation, only 40% were on anticoagulation and only a quarter of those had therapeutic INRs. Physicians may be hesitant to prescribe anticoagulation to elderly individuals with AFib due to potential for falls. Although there is an increased risk of intracranial hemorrhage from falls, and anticoagulation is associated with intracranial hemorrhage, 
the risk of ischemic stroke in these patients at risk for falls is high enough that they still benefit from anticoagulation. A retrospective study of Medicare beneficiaries found anticoagulation in these patients reduced the composite endpoint of out-of-hospital death, hospitalization for stroke, myocardial infarction, and hemorrhage, including intracranial hemorrhage. Another study created a model calculating that an elderly person with AFib at risk for falls must have 295 falls per year for anticoagulation to not be the optimal strategy. Sorry, there we go. Uh, the big question in this elderly group is not whether or not to anticoagulate, but rather which anticoagulant to use, VKAs or DOACs. So DOACs have several properties that may make them the preferred agent in the elderly. With DOACs, there is no requirement for routine blood monitoring. This is great for the elderly patient with decreased mobility, less social support, or limited transportation options who may find it difficult to get routine blood work. There's fixed dosing. Without fluctuating doses, blister packs and dose sets are simpler and less risk of dosing error. Doacs are not vitamin K dependent, so if you have a patient that loves kale salad, but only on Mondays, it's not a problem. Lastly, elderly patients are at risk of polypharmacy. With Doacs, there are less drug-drug interactions to worry about. Although in the setting of drug-drug interactions, with warfarin, you can adjust the dose based on INR to compensate for these interactions, whereas we cannot do this with the Doacs. Let's look at the data comparing DOAC to VKAs in the elderly. Unfortunately, we don't have any RCTs comparing DOAC to VKA specifically in the elderly, but instead we can look at meta-analyzed data from the elderly subgroups defined as age over 75 in the AFib and VTE DOAC trials. So this systematic review found significant heterogeneity when pooling all DOACs together compared to VKA. So they didn't report the results for all DOACs compared to VKA, but instead individual DOACs versus VKA. But we should note that these comparisons come from different studies with different patient demographics. So we can't conclude from this data that one DOAC is superior to another. For example, compared to the rocket AF demographic of rivaroxaban versus VK and AFib, the Aristotle demographic of apixaban versus VK and AFib was younger, had lower CHAD scores, and less history of stroke. So instead, we will discuss the results of DOACs in general compared to VKs. So regarding efficacy, some comparisons showed DOACs to have less stroke or systemic embolism compared to VKA, and some comparisons showed no difference. But overall, DOACs were at least as efficacious at decreasing the risk of stroke or systemic embolism in AFib. They were at least as efficacious at decreasing the risk of recurrent VTE, with most comparisons showing no difference, one comparison showing a lower risk on DOAC. DOACs were at least as safe regarding major bleeding, with half the comparisons showing no difference and half showing a decreased risk on DOACs. They were at least half as safe regarding fatal bleeding, uh, with most comparisons showing no difference and one comparison showing a decrease on DOACs. They were at least as safe regarding intracranial bleeding, with almost all comparisons showing a lower risk on DOACs. And there we go. At least it's safe regarding clinically relevant bleeding with most comparisons showing no difference and one comparison showing a lower risk on DOACs. Lastly, we have limited RCT data in our elderly subgroup as to the risk of GI bleeding, but at least for dibigatran, the risk of GI bleeding appears higher than for VKA. Overall, the data from the subgroup analyses from the large RCTs favors DOAC over VKA. But while large trials are important in establishing drug efficacy and safety, real-world practice can differ from trials, including different patient demographics, clinical circumstances, and practice patterns. So it's important to look at post-marketing data as well. The data from the real-world studies are fairly consistent with the RCTs, showing DOACs are at least as effective as VKAs at decreasing stroke or systemic embolism, major bleeding, intracranial hemorrhage, and mortality. And again, we see a possible concern about a higher risk of GI bleeding on DOACs. So I'll leave this summary here on the left as we go through the individual studies. This first study is from insurance claim databases in the US, including AFib patients of age 80 or greater comparing DOACs to BKA. Since they used insurance claim data, it's a very large study, about 90,000 patients. The study compared individual DOACs, dibigatran, rivaroxaban, and apixaban against VKA. 
all three DOACs had less stroke or systemic embolism compared to VKA, but the risk of overall major bleeding varied by DOAC, with apixaban having less, the bigotran having similar, and rivaroxaban having more. Looking at bleeding subtypes, all three DOACs had less intracranial hemorrhage compared to VKA, but GI bleeding compared to VKA varied by DOAC, again, with apixaban having less, the bigotran having similar, and rivaroxaban having more. The same study found lower all-cause mortality for all DOACs compared to VKA. This is another insurance claims database study with AFib patients age 80 or greater. This one's from Italy. They did two analyses, and the first one in intention to treat analyses on the top. DOACs had lower mortality compared to VKA, no difference in ischemic stroke, no difference in major bleeding, but more GI bleeding, specifically lower GI bleeding. The as-treated analysis on the bottom showed DOACs have no difference in mortality, ischemic stroke, or major bleeding. Less intracranial hemorrhage, but again, more GI bleeding, specifically lower GI bleeding. Okay, so now we're looking at age 85 or older. This is more insurance claims data from France. Compared to VKA, the bigotran had less stroke or systemic embolism, mortality in ICH. Although there was no difference in overall major bleeding, there was an increase in GI bleeding compared to VKA. With rivaroxaban, there was no difference in stroke, systemic embolism, major bleeding, mortality, intracranial hemorrhage, or GI bleeding compared to VKA. Okay, now we are at age 90 or greater with AFib. Again, with insurance claim data, this one is from Taiwan. And they found no difference between DOACs and VKA in ischemic stroke or major bleeding, but DOACs had less intracranial hemorrhage. Given the high mortality in this age group, they also did a competing risk model as well, but the results remained fairly stable. Oops, sorry. Okay. Okay, so now we're into the smaller studies. This is from an Italian registry of about 600 patients. Comparing DOACs to VKAs, there was no difference in ischemic stroke or major bleeding, but there was less permanent discontinuation with the DOACs. And lastly, this single center study from Japan of about 300 patients comparing DOAC to VKA versus no oral anticoag and AFib patients age 90 or greater found DOACs had the least strokes or TIAs, but otherwise the study was a bit of an outlier in that they found the most major bleeding on DOACs and the best survival on VKAs. Okay, so let's shift gears slightly now and look at the demographic of elderly AFib patients who may not be candidates for VKA. So there's a couple RCTs which have assessed DOACs as a potential solution in this population. Here's a subgroup analysis of those 75 or older from the Averroes RCT, which randomized AFib patients who were not candidates for VKA to either apixaban or aspirin. The patients were deemed to be not candidates for VKA because they had either already demonstrated to be unsuitable for them or were expected to be unsuitable. The apixaban group received 5 milligram BID or 2.5 milligram BID if they met criteria for reduced dose. And the aspirin group received 81 milligram to 324 milligram at the discretion of the local investigator. They found less stroke or systemic embolism with the pixaban and no difference in major bleeding. The subgroup analysis also looked at age 85 or older and found similar results with less stroke or systemic embolism with the pixaban and similar risk of major bleeding. A more recent RCT from Japan randomized AFib patients age 80 or greater who were not candidates for oral anticoagulation stroke prevention doses to low dose edoxaban at 15 mg daily or placebo. Participants were deemed to be not candidates for oral anticoagulation due to creatinine clearance 15 to 30, previous history of bleeding from a critical area or GI bleeding, low body weight under 45 kg, continuous NSAID use, or current antiplate use. They found less stroke or systemic embolism with edoxaban and no difference in major bleeding. There was no difference in intracranial hemorrhage between the groups, but more GI bleeding on edoxaban. Despite the decreased risk of stroke or systemic embolism with edoxaban, no mortality, was, sorry, no mortality difference was observed between the study groups. One last item I wanted to cover in our discussion of DOACs and the elderly is compliance. In general, poor drug adherence is common in the elderly due to declining cognitive processes, increasing medications, vision or hearing impairment, limited social resources, and limited financial resources. With DOAC, so we have no routine INR monitoring and fixed dosing. So we might expect improved compliance compared to VKAs. 
Initial data from the large DOAC RCTs, although not specific to the elderly, did not show a difference in drug discontinuation between DOACs and VKAs. But if we look at real world data, we can see less drug discontinuation with the DOACs. So this is data from Germany. We can see improved adherence with the Bigatran and Rivaroxaban compared to VKA. And this is from the UK, and again, similar trends showing better compliance with the DOACs compared to VKAs. So overall, DOAC seem to be the better option for anticoagulation compared to BKA in this demographic. The next question is which DOAC to choose. One of the insurance claim st studies we looked at earlier also did an inter-DOAC comparison with the Pixaban, Rivaroxaban, and Bigatran. It suggested that a Pixaban had the least stroke systemic embolism and the least major bleeding. But we must keep in mind this wasn't a randomized study, so we don't have any definite answers. In addition to bleeding risk, there are other characteristics we should consider in our elderly patients to help determine the right DOAC for the right patient. So this table is adapted from the How I Treat paper in blood from 2019. So different characteristics to consider, the bleeding risk, previous GI bleed, poor renal function, if they have GERD or dyspepsia, if they get their drugs through NG or PEG tube, or if they just have poor adherence. So use these characteristics to fine tune the right DOAC for your patient. And of course, we want to do everything we can to minimize the bleeding risk. We want to ensure appropriate dosing. Some DOACs depend on the indication, sorry, dependent on the indication may have a different dose based on age, weight, or renal function. We also want to control for comorbidities like hypertension. And we want to avoid drugs that can increase the bleeding risk, such as antiplatelet medications or NSAIDs. Okay, so to summarize, increasing age increases the risk of atrial fibrillation and VTE. Increasing age increases the risk of anticoagulant-associated bleeding. Despite this increased bleeding risk, AFib patients still benefit from anticoagulation. In the treatment of AFib or VTE compared to VKAs, DOACs may be more effective. They have a lower risk of intracranial hemorrhage. They might have a higher risk of GI bleed, but they probably have lower mortality and they probably have better adherence. The right DOAC for the right patient is based on patient characteristics, and you want to minimize other risk factors for bleeding. Okay, so let's go back to our case. We had Mr. Y, uh, eight-year-old gentleman, new diagnosis of atrial fibrillation. Uh, again, the same answers, no antiplatelet anticoagulation, antiplatelet only, anticoagulant VKA, and anticoagulant DOAC. Uh, I'll give you a few seconds to make your choice, and we'll see if we have any differences. Okay, oh, sorry. I'm, I'm assuming people would go with DOAX, which I agree with. I would go with DOAX in that choice. Okay, okay. Okay, perfect. Okay, so next we'll move on to DOAX at extremes of weight. And again, we'll start with the case. Uh, Mrs. H, she's a 45-year-old lady. She has a new unprovoked PE. She has a past medical history of dyslipidemia. She only takes a torvastatin. She has no previous VTE, no previous bleeding history. Her weight is 160 kilograms for a BMI of 55. Her creatinine is 120, so with Cocroft gold calculation, her creatinine clearance is 132. So my question for you is, would you, how would you anticoagulate this patient? Option A is lone liquid heparin, uh, dosed on the weight. Option B is VKA, target INR 2 to 3. Option C is DOAC and checking DOAC levels. And then option D is DOAC but without DOAC levels. So let's give you some time to get that done. Like your answer. Okay, let's see what we have. Okay, so let's see. Most people are going with the VKA, and then we have a few people with DOAC, split evenly, check DOAC, not DOAC, and then some. Okay, good. So Let's keep that in the back of your mind again. Uh, let's go through the presentation and then we will come back and see if anyone changes our mind. All right, so this is Canadian data. We can see that increasing prevalence of higher BMI comparing 2004 to 2015. And with increasing BMI comes an increased risk of AFib as seen in the figure on the left and increasing risk of VTE as seen on the right. <clears throat> 
Looking at the other end of the spectrum, we can see that although this is a small demographic, there has also been an increase in the prevalence of the underweight comparing 2004 to 2015. Interestingly, the association between AFib and BMI seems to be U-shaped. In the figure on the left, we can see the probability of AFib is higher not only in those of high BMI, but also in low BMI. This increase in a risk of AFib seems to be independent of thyroid disease, chronic lung disease, or cancer. Low BMI, however, does not seem to increase the risk of VTE, as we can be seen here in the forest plot on the right. So the main concern for the use of DOAX and the extremes of weight is a potential for altered drug pharmacokinetics. With slow liquid heparin, this isn't a concern because we base the dose on the patient's weight. With vitamin K antagonists, we know heavier patients require a higher maintenance dose, and we can adjust the INR, uh, sorry, can base the dose on the desired INR. With DOAX, however, we have essentially fixed dosing and without routine monitoring. Some institutions have the capability to test for DOAC drug levels, but we don't really know how to interpret the level since we don't have a therapeutic range. So the altered pharmacokinetics seen in the extremes of weight are a result of multiple factors. In patients with increased adipose tissue, there is a larger volume of distribution, which is particularly concerning for the moderately lipophilic DOACs. There is conflicting data regarding the effect of weight on renal clearance and hepatic clearance, but there may be a nonlinear increase in DOAC clearance with increasing weight. Lastly, although albumin binding of drugs doesn't seem to be affected by increasing weight, in cachectic states, there may be decreased protein binding. So overall, the concern in the use of DOACs and those of extreme obesity could it result in lower DOAC concentrations and ineffective anticoagulation. And the use of DOACs in the underweight could result in increased DOAC concentrations and increased risk of bleeding. Okay, so let's start with the pharmacokinetic data. The pharmacokinetic data seems reassuring. So this is from a post-hoc analysis of the RELY study, which compared dabigatran to VKA in atrial fibrillation patients. We don't have data specifically for those of severe, severe obesity, so BMI over 40 or weight over 120 kilograms, but we can compare pharmacokinetic data for weight under 50 kilograms, 100 to 50, and then over 100 kilograms. The dabigatran trough concentration varied by weight group, but renal function measured by cocroft gald creatinine clearance was much more an important factor in determining the bigger trend concentration than weight alone. This is rivaroxaban PK data. This model was developed from 913 patients, including 19 underweight and 74 with severe obesity. The figure shows that body weight had only a minor influence on rivaroxaban exposure. As with the previous study, creatinine clearance, again calculated by cocroft gald was the most significant covariate affecting uh, river span exposure. This, there you go. this is a Pixaban PK data from 54 healthy subjects, including 18 patients who were underweight and 18 with severe obesity. As with the other studies, there was a modest change in Pixaban exposure with extremes of weight, but it was unlikely to be clinically relevant. And lastly, with Edoxaban, so this is PK data from the Engage AF Timmy RCT, which randomized AFib patients to edoxaban or VKA. Looking at the edoxaban trough concentrations, uh, including 25 in the underweight and 518 in those of BMI over 35, the trough edoxaban concentration was similar across the groups. They also checked anti 10 levels, and those were also similar across, across the weight groups. So the PK data is reassuring, but really clinical outcomes is what we care about. So let's look at the data for the high BMI group first, and then we'll come back later to the low BMI. So while there are no RCTs looking at DOAC versus VKA, specifically in those of high BMI, we can look at meta-analyzed data from the subgroups from the large AFib and VTE DOAC trials. Unfortunately, there's poor consistency across these studies and how increased weight groups are defined. Some studies defined weight groups based on their BMI and others based on weight. And furthermore, the threshold for what's considered increased weight varies from study to study. Okay. But keeping that in mind, starting with the VTE data, we can see there is no difference in VTE recurrence comparing DOAC versus VKA. No difference in major or clinically relevant non-major bleeding. In the AFib data, there is no difference in efficacy with DOACs compared to VKA, and no difference in major bleeding 
So the subgroup data is reassuring for the use of DOACs and those of increased weight. The high BMI group we are most interested in is those of severe obesity. So BMI greater than 40 or weight 120 kilograms or greater. The severe obesity group was not well represented in these phase three trials, composing only about 5% of the population. So here's a summary of the subgroup analyses from, of uh, severe obesity groups from those large trials. There's limited information, but if what we can see, there doesn't seem to be a difference in safety or efficacy. Let's move on to the real world studies. This is data from a prospective registry of DOAC users in Germany for both AFib and VTE, including patients of all weights. Unfortunately, the study did not include a warfarin comparator group, so we'll see what we can do. Uh, the study assessed effectiveness of DOACs as a composite endpoint of stroke, TIA, systemic embolism, DVT or PE, and the safety of DOACs as major bleeding. Although the frequency of risk factors for cardiovascular outcomes was higher with increased BMI, the rates of the effective endpoint was lowest in the extreme obesity group compared to obese and moderate obese. The bleeding risk was highest in the severe obesity group, but they did have the most risk factor for bleeding. Here's a systematic review of all studies comparing DOAX versus VKA and AFib patients with severe obesity. The Hans Loser study, so that's the one up top, is a post hoc analysis of the Aristotle RCT data, which we already looked at. Uh, the rest are all retrospective cohorts. Uh, we should point out that most of the data from this meta-analysis comes from the Peterson study, uh, which used data from insurance claim databases. Overall, the meta-analysis found no difference in stroke or systemic embolism between the study groups, but less major bleeding with the DOACs. The study also looked specifically at rivaroxaban versus VKA and apixaban versus VKA, uh, but found no difference in stroke or systemic embolism or major bleeding in these comparisons. Okay, so this systematic review compared DOAC to VKA in the treatment of acute VTE in those with severe obesity. Again, this review found only retrospective studies. Almost 90% in this meta-analysis came from a single study, the Spiropolis study, which used data from insurance claims databases and compared specifically rivaroxaban versus VKA. In this meta-analysis, DOACs were non inferior to VKA in terms of preventing VTE recurrence and the risk of major bleeding. Okay, this small single center of study of about 180 patients was not included in either systematic review, so I'll just discuss it briefly. The study compared DOAC to VKA and those anticoagulated for AFib, VTE, or post-op thromboprophylaxis with severe obesity, and there was no difference in thrombotic outcomes or major bleeding in the DOAC group compared to the VKA group. Lastly, this study was just published. I looked at registry data of adults with severe obesity with acute VT on DOACs. We don't have a comparator arm, but of the 109 patients included, there was no recurrent VTE, no major bleeding, and only six clinically relevant non-major bleeding. Okay, so one last item to discuss regarding DOAC use in severe obesity is the use of DOAC plasma levels. Initial guidance from the ISTH in 2016 suggested DOACs should not be used in patients with severe obesity due to limited clinical data. And if they are used, consider checking peak and trough DOAC levels to see if they fall within the expected range. But since 2016, we have increasing data to suggest that DOACs are as effective and safe in the severe obesity demographic. Furthermore, while we can check DOAC levels and compare them to pharmacokinetic data, we don't really have a therapeutic range that we can aim for. So overall, I would suggest against routine DOAC levels in those with severe obesity. Okay, so let's go back to DOAC use in the underweight. While there are no RCTs looking at DOAC versus VKA specifically in the underweight, we can look at subgroups from the large RCTs. So we don't have any BMI subgroups, so we can't really say underweight, but we can look at the lower weight subgroups. Numerically, efficacy looks pretty similar, but the bleeding risk looks a little higher on VKA, but I mean, this is all very limited information. With real world data, we're also very limited in data. So we have data from that prospective DOAC registry in Germany that we had discussed earlier. The study discusses higher rates of cardiovascular outcomes, major bleeding, and excess mortality in the underweight groups 
but uh, did not report the specific risks, likely because the underweight group was so small, only 17 patients out of the 3,432. We also don't have a warfarin comparator group, so it's hard to know what to make of this. Of note, the underweight group also had a higher prevalence of previous stroke, kidney disease, and cancer. This retrospective study assessed AFib patients of all body weights anticoagulant with DOAX. The study found a higher rate of major bleeding and all-cause death in the underweight group, but no difference in ischemic stroke or systemic embolism. Again, we don't have a warfarin comparator group, so difficult to know what to make of this. The authors also did analysis using a weight of 60 kilograms as a reference value for underweight, but after adjusting for weight under 60 kilograms, it was not independently associated with major bleeding or deaths. So it seems that BMI is more important rather than absolute weight. Okay, so to summarize, there's an increased risk of atrial fibrillation and VTE with increasing BMI. The extremes of weight may affect DOAC exposure, but is unlikely to be clinically relevant. DOACs are probably as effective and safe in those with severe obesity. So that's mostly from retrospective data. We don't have a ton of data, but if what we do have, it does seem probably fine. So it's one of those patient-to-patient -patient discussion kind of things. DOAC levels are not routinely required in patients with severe obesity, and minimal data is available on the effectiveness and safety of DOACs in the underweight patients. They're probably at higher risk for bleeding, but is that a DOAC thing or a DOAC warfarin thing? It's really unclear. Okay, so let's go back to our case. So we had Mrs. H. She's a 45-year-old lady, new provoked, sorry, new pro unprovoked PE. Uh, her weight's 160 kilogram, BMI 55, creatinine clearance is 132. And back to the question, how would you anticoagulate this patient? There you go. So option A is low molecular weight heparin based on the weight, VKA, target INR2 to 3, DOAC with DOAC levels, or ED DOAC without DOAC levels. So I'll give you a few seconds to figure that out. Okay, let's see what we got. Yeah. Oops. Sorry, I might be frozen again. I'll let Holly take over. There we go. Okay. <laughs> okay, so I've convinced some people, but not everyone. That's okay. Okay, so I would, I would do DOAC in this patient. Uh, I would have a patient conversation with them and discuss this is the data we have. We don't know 100%, but the data is reassuring. But definitely it is a patient-to-patient -patient preference thing. Some patients might pick VKA, and that's fine. And I think that's all I have. Okay, perfect. That's all I have. Uh, That's great. Many thanks, Jamil. This was a great presentation, a great summary. Um, we do have several questions um, from our participants that are relevant okay. to both you and, uh, and Dr. Tran. So I'll invite Alan to um, come back on as well, and um, we can share the, uh, the questions between you guys. Um, Alan, one of the questions from uh, one of our faculty, Dr. Selby, she was um, particularly interested in, um, I think it was the... Um, uh, um, a pixaban compared to aspirin study in atrial fibrillation. If there was a, a better description of why patients older than 75 weren't candidates yep. for, for warfarin. Sorry, is that question for me? Yeah, yeah. I'll okay, sorry. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So I looked into the study. They don't give a good description. It's okay. just literally, they just say demonstrate to be not suitable for VKA or assume to be non suitable for VKA. So it's really at the discretion of the investigator, which I don't think was great. Comparatively, the edoxaban study did have a better description of what means you're not suitable for a VKA. Okay. Um, yeah. Perfect. Um, so some, several of our questions have a, a similar theme, and I'll, I'll ask you both because um, practice variation can certainly happen. Um, do you have uh, an absolute cutoff in terms of obesity with a body weight where you would not be feel comfortable using a directoral anticoagulant? Um, whether you use a body weight or, or a BMI threshold, do you have a particular threshold where you say, uh, I'm just not comfortable even having that discussion with a patient? Jamil, yeah. I'll ask you first. Sure. Yeah. So I don't have a specific threshold. So I mean, the weights have gone pretty high in that registry we just talked about that was just published. I think the highest was 200 something kilograms. So I mean, you can go pretty high. Uh, looking at the curves, I would look at the PK data. It doesn't seem to be that big a difference. But that being said, increasing weight, I would be more concerned. Uh, but really, again, patient preference. There isn't a cutoff specifically where I would say you should not use a DOAC. Uh, but I would probably have a bit more concern. Um, 
based on very little data. Okay. And Alan, how about yourself? What's your practice? Yeah, I, uh, I guess for me, it somewhat depends on, on the robotic risk. So in an acute VTE, I, I'm usually a little, you know, within the first three months, I'm usually a little more wary of, of not using GOAC just because I'm uncomfortable with that. But, you know, after the first six months or, or whatever, uh, you know, I think, again, I somewhat extrapolate from the extended trials of, of you know, if a half dose DOAC in a normal weight patient is, is good, then, you know, a full dose DOAC in a very obese patient hopefully is good. Um, so, so I, I've, you know, when it's that type of uh, those bounds and those risk factors, I'm a bit more comfortable with it. In terms of absolute weight, you know, I don't know. Again, I don't really have a clear threshold other than just gut feeling. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. And would it be safe to say that in your patients where you're considering um, extended anticoagulation for a secondary VTE prevention, for example, if they were morbidly obese, would you consider a dose reduction? in DOAC or we maintain them on the lower dose? Alan, I'll ask you. I actually don't. This with all those ex extended trials, at least anyway, there was never really a huge difference between the lower dose and the standard dose. So I just feel comfortable with using the full dose and staying okay. on the full dose. Know? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm the same, just because we don't have the data. So for most, I'll keep them on the full dose. If there's any concern about bleeding risk, then I, I'd drop them to the half dose. But for most of them, just based on lack of data, I'd keep them on the full dose. Thank you. Um, one of our other questions is uh, is related to, uh, I think you both touched on this, um, GI bleeding risk with the directoral anticoagulants. And if you can comment on whether there's a difference between upper GI bleeding and lower GI bleeding um, event rates uh, with the directoral anticoagulants compared to warfarin, for example, or if we just don't know that information. Um, Jimmy, I'll start with you. Sure, yeah. So, yeah, so at least, I mean, in the elderly, we saw that there was the increased risk. With the RCT data, we know at least the bigger trend. With the other data is all retrospective studies, so it's hard to say for sure is there higher risk with the DOACs, like epixaban, which seems to be lower risk compared to warfarin and vitamin K antagonists. Um, the studies seem to defer a bit in terms of upper GI versus lower GI. Uh, it's the high, what's the higher risk? Um, yeah, so I'm kind of trailing off there. Yeah, no, that's okay. Alan, how about yourself? Yeah, I, I don't think most studies really don't talk too much in terms of that granularity, apart from some of the more recent cancer-associated thrombosis studies, but I think most of them are just GI bleeding in general. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I don't think they do, um, uh, discern them in the studies. I think from my personal clinical experience, I've seen more upper GI bleeding um, with anticoagulants, um, in particular um, directoral anticoagulants. Um, then, then I have uh, lower GI bleeding, but that's just uh, my personal practice. Um, and then um, one of the other questions that came in um, for you, Jamil, is uh, mm -hmm. in patients who have a lower BMI or a lower body yeah. weight, if you're using a, a, a body weight um, threshold, would yeah. you consider um, a lower dose direct oral anticoagulant if they don't necessarily mm -hmm. meet criteria for a dose reduction? Yeah, so they're probably at increased bleeding risk, whatever we do. If they did not meet the criteria for the lower dose, I would still do the full dose. Um, and then hopefully for extended VT, I would drop them to lower dose uh, with AFib if they met the criteria lower dose. But upfront, I would do the full dose um, unless they met the criteria, although they would likely higher be at increased risk of bleeding, but they'd also be at increased risk of bleeding with warfarin as well. Yeah, and Alan, how about yourself? Yeah, I do the same. Okay. Right. So yeah, so I think the important uh, message there is that um, you really do need to dose according to your indication. Um, so whether it's VTE and you have the higher dosing strategy um, for acute VTE management, um, and same with uh, atrial fibrillation, you would really only do dose reduction based on the um, pre-specified criteria according to each drug's uh, product monograph. Um, another uh, interesting question that's come in is um, uh, relevant for, for both of your talks because you both discussed elderly patients and frailty as a, as a component of um, anticoagulation and bleeding risks. For patients that are known to be high risk of falls and they do have an indication for anticoagulants, is there a time when you would prefer using something like aspirin rather than um, a, even a direct oral anticoagulant? although we know that direct oral anticoagulants overall have a lower bleeding risk compared to warfarin, for example. Alan, I'll start with you. Yeah, that's a great question. And, and so I usually point to the Avro study, as um, Jamil mentioned, which is comparative expand to, to aspirin. 
Um, obviously, that's a very different population, a bit more robust and RCT type of patients, but that really suggested that the bleeding risks were the same with aspirin and apixaban. So, so if I so you know, I usually don't use aspirin if I can use apixaban at least, you know, as long as renal function and everything is, is fine, mm -hmm. um, is, is what I tend to do. And there's been, you know, maybe some suggestion that aspirin may not provide all that much benefit anyway in terms of stroke prevention. So the, the risk, there just be more, may be more risk than benefit. Great. Um, and Jamil, do you have a, a different practice or is that? Yeah, no, so I, I completely agree. And just, just to add to that, if you look at the VT population as well, if we look at the extended DOAC trials, like the low dose RIVA versus aspirin, it wasn't specifically frail or elderly, but the bleeding risk was the same between the aspirin and the low dose RIVA. Um, so yeah, in general, I would do DOAC over aspirin, even in these frailer patients, yeah. Great, great. I think that's a really important point to uh, mention that aspirin is uh, is um, often considered as a, a benign or safe medication, but we have seen that there are um, bleeding concerns with uh, with use of low dose aspirin. Um, another question that has uh, that has come through is um, with respect to patients and uh, even some clinicians are still concerned about lack of uh, reversal strategies for some of the directoral anticoagulants and if that influences your uh, decision making or your discussion with a patient, for example, and what anticoagulant you choose. Um, Jamil, I'll start with you. Sure. Yeah, so uh, for me it doesn't. So if you have a major bleed on warfarin or DOAC, um, the outcomes are fairly similar. So from the big RCTs, I think it was a 10% fatality rate for major bleed and then a 40% fatality rate for intracranial bleed on both warfarin and DOAX. And that's back when we did have uh, vitamin K and PCC for warfarin and we had no reversal agents for the DOAX. Um, we know from big RCTs that you're less likely to have fatal bleeding or intracranial bleeding on the, uh, the DOAX. So I would do DOAX because you're less likely to have the bleed. And then even if you do have a bleed, even though we have reversal agents for VKAs, it's questionable how effective they are. Um, and now we have idrocizumab and someday we'll get NX uh, alpha. So I would do DOAX, yeah. Okay, and Alan, what about your practice? Yeah, I'm pretty basically such the same. In terms of talking to the patient, I always I also, I also do add on that, you know, warfarin needs a reversal agent because of how long its effect is. So try to make it, makes sense from from that standpoint to them as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just from my own personal practice, I, I echo what you guys are saying. And I think the one of the key things to um, consider is that um, you want to really reduce risk of bleeding at the outset. And I agree that we know uh, overall directoral anticoagulants are the safer class of medications for doing that. Um, and, and the presence and, and use of a, a reversal agent really doesn't um, give me any reassurance because really all it does is prevent that next bleed when you're using it. Um, it doesn't unfortunately reverse any damage that's already been caused by bleeding. And so I think that's a misconception about what the purpose of a reversal agent is for. Um, so we're really trying to prevent the next bleed from happening uh, when we use it. Um, so I agree. I think uh, at the outset, you really want to have that conversation about what is the, the safest medication that's available for your patient. Um, and now, uh, just a, a clarification from one of our participants. So uh, the consensus was that for um, patients needing anticoagulation for extended treatment of VTE, for example, that are morbidly obese, we would use the uh, standard dosing of anticoagulation and we would not do a dose reduction. Um, so that's just a clarification um, for one of our participants. Um, and uh, I think, um, I think uh, that wraps up uh, our questions at this point in time. Um, I would like to thank um, Jamil and, uh, and Alan for their time today. This was a, a really informative um, session and I, I think it was uh, um, great participation from our, our audience members. Um, I would like to thank you all on behalf of Thrombosis Canada for attending our session this evening um, and to our great presenters. Uh, just a reminder that um, we do have uh, an evaluation for you to complete and please do visit our Thrombosis Canada website as we have lots of great tools and clinical guides available for you. Um, so again, many thanks uh, to all of you for participating and to our speakers. Have a good evening. Thanks. Yeah.